Welcome to this virtual panel discussion on Black Advocates. I'm Tim Hubner. I serve as the chair of the Board of Editors of the Journal of Supreme Court History. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this session. And first, I want to um, introduce to you our executive uh, director, uh, Jim Duff, uh, who has some words of welcome. Thank you very much, Tim. And on behalf of the society, I would like to thank all of you for your scholarly efforts to give early black attorneys their overdue recognition. The society is very proud that you've chosen the Journal of Supreme Court History as the forum for telling their remarkable stories and shining a light on their legal careers. These attorneys deserve to be better known as pioneers of the Supreme Court Bar, and the society is pleased to hold this discussion today as part of our ongoing mission to publish original research on topics that have been overlooked or understudied. Thank you all for your contributions and thank you, Tim, for convening this. Thank you, Jim. And uh, now I'm going to introduce our three panelists who will be speaking. And our format is that each of them will have the opportunity to present uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then afterward, we'll engage in some uh, uh, conversation. And, uh, but uh, we are um, I'm gonna start with uh, Professor Christopher Brooks, who is a professor at East Strasburg University. He is a, a professor of history. Um, his work, as you'll see in a few moments, deals with John S. Uh, Rock, who is the first African-American uh, attorney to be um, ad admitted to the Supreme Court bar. Um, you'll hear a very interesting story. His article, uh, will be published in the summer of 2023 in the uh, July issue that is volume 48 of uh, number two. Um, second, we'll hear from, um, from John G. Browning, who is a partner in Spencer Fane in Plano, Texas, and also is a distinguished uh, jurist in residence and professor of law at Faulkner University. He served as an appellate justice on the Texas Fifth uh, District Court of Appeals and has led uh, campaigns to gain posthumous bar ad, ad, admission for black men uh, denied licenses to practice law in the 19th century. His article was published in volume 47 number three of the Journal of Supreme Court History, uh, Forgotten First, Edward J. Waring, First Black Supreme Court um, Advocate in the case of Jones versus the United States. And third and finally, we will hear from Jim Feldman, who is an attorney in private practice specializing in Supreme Court uh, 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 litigation. Mr. Feldman was assistant to the Solicitor General from 1989 to 2006, where he first came across the name of uh, Cornelius Jones, whom we'll be hearing about when he was reading the case Gibson versus Mississippi, which we'll be hearing about um, as he was doing research. His article uh, on uh, Jones was published in volume 47 of the Journal of Supreme Court, um, history, and it is called So Forcibly uh, Presented by His Counsel Who Are of His Race, Cornelius Jones, Forgotten Black Supreme Court Advocate, um, and Fights for Civil Rights in the Plessy Era. So I am going to turn it over to our first speaker, um, Professor Brooks, who is going to tell us about John S. Rock. Professor Brooks. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on one moment. So my paper will discuss this uh, very interesting, famous first. John Stuart Rock 
and really through the assistance of Charles Sumner, Senator from Massachusetts, uh, becomes the first African-American to be granted admission to the Supreme Court bar. And his road, his pathway there was not the easiest. Um, Rock is not all that well known. I would argue to say that neither are the other two jurists that we'll be speaking about today. Uh, Rock managed to, by the time he was 27 years old, uh, be a teacher and actually school master, I should add, dentist, uh, physician, abolitionist, and then attorney, and on top of that, justice of the peace. Um, he managed to do that, you know, born in 1825, he managed to do, accomplish all that by 1861. I would argue that there are very few people of any race or ethnicity at any time in history who accomplished all of that in such a short period of time. Um, he was also known for being a um, pretty well-known lyceum speaker. And since today is actually March 6th, the anniversary of Dred Scott uh, in 1857, the following year on Christmas Attic's Day, uh, well, actually March 5th, um, Rock delivered what was known as the first speech um, advocating what becomes known as Black is Beautiful. Um, I'll just read this quickly to you, if you'll allow me. The prejudice which some white men have or affect to have against my color gives me no pain. If old mother nature had held out as well as she commenced, we should probably have had fewer varieties in the races. When I contrast the fine, tough, muscular system, the beautiful, rich color, the full, broad features, and the gracefully frizzled hair of the Negro, with the delicate physical organization, wan color, sharp features, and lank hair of the Caucasian, I am inclined to believe that when the white man was created, nature was pretty well exhausted. But determined to keep up appearances, she pinched up his features and did the best she could under the circumstances. I would say that was ra be radical today, let alone in 1858. Um, but the core of the article has a lot more to do with these two men in their relationship. There are a series of 12 um, letters exchanged that we know of, there may have been more, exchanged between John Rock and Charles Sumner. And <clears throat> some of these letters uh, lead us to his, uh, John Rock's admittance to the court. And then on top of that exchange was the exchange of letters between Senator Sumner and Sam in Portland Chase, Chief Justice of the court. Uh, the man who replaced Connie after he passed away in October of 1864. Um, Rock, as you can see here, certainly fought well of Chief Justice Chase. And I should also add, and you'll see this in the article, that Rock was rather persistent in his, uh, his desire, in, in sort of sharing his desire to become the first African-American admitted to argue before the Supreme Court. However, uh, sadly, Rock never actually gets the chance to argue the, a case before the court. He tragically died um, in 1866 before he ever had the opportunity. But despite that, I, I want to share with you that John S. Rock prevailed in the end. Um, and one of the other things that comes out in the article is the kind of challenges that Chase would have had in trying to convince his fellow justices that admitting Rock would be okay. I mean, we have to mind, I mean, starting with the, the um, 
D.W. Middleton, clerk of the court, um, was a slave owner. Um, there's actually an account, if you believe it was in the Boston Journal, talking about how uh, <clears throat> when Rock is eventually admitted on the 1st of February, 1865, as the first advocate permitted, a uh, black advocate to argue before the court, um, Middleton basically making a sort of scowl. Uh, so, so this was quite a challenge. If you think about it, here's a, a you know, a dark skinned black man, very proud of his heritage uh, coming down below the Mason Dixon line and being made the first uh, advocate, you know, advocate before the court. Uh, fourth uh, black lawyer in the, in the state of Massachusetts, uh, a man who Rock would be a man also who would have to get freedom, you know, shows freedom papers in order to travel. Uh, it was uh, quite a thing, uh, to say the least. So I just wanted to give just a very, very brief, just a couple minute overview, because I'd rather uh, save the time to have an exchange with my colleagues here, because I think we all, all have a uh, a lot to say as we learned at the um, the American Society of Legal Historians in Chicago. Uh, this is a good team of people to work with. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Brooks. Uh, we will turn it over to uh, John Browning. Thank you very much, and I'd like to uh, join my colleagues in thanking uh, the Supreme Court Historical Society for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, as I echo Chris's comments, that uh, it's always great to be with these uh, distinguished gentlemen and, and outstanding scholars. Uh, this is a subject that you know you're you're getting a chance to see sort of a chronological overview of um, black lawyers as advocates before the Supreme Court, uh, as Professor Brooks just. Um, uh, uh, noted uh, and described, uh, we have the first uh, Black lawyer admitted to practice, sadly, because of uh, uh, the state of his, his health. We don't get the benefit of seeing uh, John S. Rock's uh, brilliance as, as an advocate. Um, that torch would be passed, uh, and uh, eventually uh, it would be passed to a young lawyer, uh, only licensed five years, uh, before he got a chance to argue on the biggest legal stage of all, the U.S. Supreme Court, a young man from Maryland named Everett J. Waring. But um, it, it's it's interesting that we are getting this opportunity to describe this because uh, when most uh, lawyers and judges, even uh, Black lawyers and judges, like uh, our newest justice on the Supreme Court, Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson, when they acknowledge the trailblazers who went before them on whose shoulders they stand, many of us simply think in terms of the Thurgood Marshalls of this world, the Constance Baker Motley's. A uh, few of us really take the time to realize just how far back, um, uh, how distant in our history, uh, the contributions of Black lawyers really, really are. And um, our first uh, Black attorney admitted to practice in the U.S. is in 1844, Macon Balling Allen. So um, we would have had more, but for, obviously, uh, discriminatory and prejudicial um, uh, policies and attitudes uh, that were then uh, prevailing. Uh, one reason why Everett Waring is not just the first uh, Black lawyer to advocate before the U.S. Supreme Court, but he's the first Black lawyer admitted in Maryland, uh, has nothing to do with lack of trying. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, in 1857, Maryland could have had its first Black lawyer when a young Dartmouth graduate, one of Dartmouth's first uh, Black graduates, Edward Garrison Draper, uh, seeks admission uh, to practice. He's pronounced uh, qualified in all respects, but for the fact that he's not white. And so sadly, he is not admitted. And that was in 1857, the same year as uh, the Dred Scott decision. Um, we see uh, after the Civil War and during Reconstruction, many other, in fact, all other former slaveholding states admitting Black lawyers to practice, except for Maryland. Maryland would not um, resent, would not um, 
uh, uh, resisted the integration of its bar uh, well into the 1880s, uh, long after the ratification of the 14th Amendment. Um, uh, Maryland, with uh, even the largest free Black population prior to the Civil War, uh, was steadfast in fighting um, all previous attempts at integrating the Maryland bar, even for Black lawyers who were admitted elsewhere and who were even admitted to practice in federal courts in Maryland. But in 1885, a young uh, Howard Law graduate, a uh, brand new graduate, uh, aided by a coalition that in many ways um, uh, pre, uh, presaged the uh, work of the NAACP, a group uh, led by Reverend Harvey Johnson called the Brotherhood of Liberty, a coalition of uh, preachers, business owners, community organizers, had been lobbying for the integration of the Maryland Bar. And with Ever Waring's admission in 1885, they finally get a black lawyer in Maryland. Um, the statute, the racially restrictive statute in Maryland itself isn't repealed until 1888, but finally we have black lawyers being admitted to practice in state courts in Maryland with ever aware. Well, the Brotherhood of Liberty uh, had found their champion and they put him to work very quickly. He, uh, he and a colleague, um, uh, James Selden Davis, um, uh, begin litigating a number of the discriminatory uh, statutes in Maryland. Uh, they engage in civil rights litigation. But in 1890, um, Everett Waring gets a chance to argue on, as I mentioned before, uh, the grandest stage of all. And it all has to do with a big pile of crap, to put it uh, colorfully, uh, guano specifically. In 1856, uh, the US government passed the Guano Islands Act. And at the time, guano, which was a rich source of phosphates used in fertilizer, was like gold. Uh, it was, you know, uh, perhaps even worth more than gold. And the act, the federal legislation authorized um, uh, American citizens to claim atolls, islands, and so forth in the name of the United States so that guano could be um, uh, cultivated for uh, the phosphates used in fertilizer. And uh, in 1857, a U.S. sea captain uh, claims an island about 30 miles west of Haiti, about 100 miles from uh, Guantanamo Bay, for uh, those in the audience who are former Marines. Um, and uh, he claims this, uh, and a private company, uh, the Navassa Island Company, proceeds to cultivate the uh, guano. But the conditions on the island are horrendous. Uh, working in the uh, tropical heat, um, uh, having to put up with the oppressive ammonia smell of, of the guano, uh, the con living conditions were horrible. Um, there's no fresh water on the island. Everything has to be brought in. Uh, there's little vegetation. Who could we possibly get, if you're the phosphate company, to work under such inhuman conditions? Well, they turn to a labor force of uh, former slaves, uh, recently freedmen, uh, who uh, they figured they could sell this as a tropical paradise. It was anything but, and uh, they just wouldn't, you know, let on. And the working conditions were horrible. Uh, the laborers uh, were were uh, subjected to corporal punishment. Uh, the conditions, as I mentioned, were horrible. And at some point, things are going to boil over. Uh, the, the racial tensions uh, boiled over uh, one day in uh, 1889. And uh, the population on the island of about 111 Black laborers uh, rise up um, in response to an incident. And as a result, uh, several white managers or superintendents are killed. Well, when a, a U.S. naval warship um, ultimately arrives, uh, the uh, so-called insurrectionists are taken into custody, and they're brought to Baltimore uh, to be tried. And there are um, uh, three trials. Uh, ultimately, three of the, um, uh, I guess one might uh, call them uh, ringleaders, is the, is the phrase that's used, are ultimately uh, convicted and found guilty of murder. 
Everett Waring is the attorney who's chosen by the Brotherhood of Liberty and other Black community organizers to defend these men. And he defends them with a very novel argument that shows he was clearly setting this up for appeal ultimately to the U.S. Supreme Court. He argues that the federal government has no jurisdiction over Navassa Island, that they never actually um, made it part of United States territory, and that uh, the language in the Guano Islands Act um, essentially left things vague uh, as far as uh, seizure of islands that are appertaining to. Well, this, this vague language uh, uh, and the lack of jurisdiction, the, the international law arguments that are made by um, uh, Everett Waring are, are innovative, uh, they are uh, well thought out, but ultimately they're unsuccessful. And the Supreme Court um, in 1890, uh, in the Jones uh, versus United States case, uh, affirms the murder conviction of uh, all three of the um, uh, convicted murderers, saying this really isn't a legislative, uh, this isn't really um, something that we can um, question as far as the judicial branch. This is really an executive decision, and that's uh, we're not going to disturb that. We're going to stay in our lane. In, interestingly enough, these arguments would resurface just 10 years later in the insular cases. And one can argue that uh, we still see the vestiges and echoes uh, of these arguments today uh, in the uh, recent Vallejo Madelo uh, case before uh, our current U.S. Supreme Court regarding the status of uh, individuals living in American Samoa and in Puerto Rico. But Everett Waring gets a chance to, to argue, and uh, it is, of course, historic. Uh, the um, fact that a, a Black man is uh, arguing this case before the nation's highest court is something that essentially escapes the attention of conventional white newspapers, but those in the Black community um, pick up on this, and they make note, uh, one of them noting, mark the change. Only 34 years after the rendering of the monstrous Dred uh, Scott decision, Negroes appear before the same court, full-fledged attorneys and counselors of law, residents of the erstwhile slave state of Maryland, to argue a question of federal jurisdiction. It's a momentous occasion, and that's not lost on the Black community. The other thing that is achieved by virtue uh, of uh, Waring's uh, vigorous uh, spirit in defense is that you might say he, he loses the battle, but he wins the war. Uh, so much public attention has been drawn to the horrendous, brutal um, uh, uh, conditions, the working conditions that the uh, Black laborers were subjected to, that a call for mercy goes out. And the president makes note of these horrendous conditions uh, that the press has uh, been noting, and he commutes the sentences to life sentences. Uh, of the uh, three convicts. So uh, he saved his clients' lives. Um, and uh, that's certainly something that can't be underestimated. So um, this is really historically significant. It launches the career uh, of a young lawyer uh, ever wearing. Uh, it uh, obviously shows the power, the organizing power of uh, the Brotherhood of Liberty in uh, mobilizing this effort. And it really sets the stage for future um, uh, arguments that uh, would be made by Black advocates before the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, John Browning. And now we will turn finally to Jim Feldman. Thanks very much. Uh, it's. I'd also like to repeat what my colleagues said. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I found it as I was doing research on Cornelius Jones, I found it's particularly interesting how this early group of Black advocates are so little known and really very little has been done in terms of research. And I'm delighted to join my two colleagues here who have done a lot. And I hope there'll be a lot of other people who will follow us because this is a very rich uh, vein to, to rich, rich material to mine. Uh, and there's a lot more to find out about them and a lot more to think about in terms of their careers and what they did. I'd like to share my screen with you here for a minute. Let me see if I can get this. Okay, here we are. Wait a second. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about Cornelius Jones. 
Uh, he was a black Mississippi lawyer born in 1858 into slavery. He died in 1931. He fought throughout his life for black voting and civil rights in the critical years around the turn of the 20th century when the Jim Crow system of racial discrimination and segregation was being formalized and consolidated in, in the South. He was one of the first black advocates to appear before the Supreme Court, as you'll hear, and that, well, any, any other means I'll talk, we'll get to that later. Um, he was in the first generation of black youths to take advantage of new educational opportunities that opened up after the Civil War. He attended Freedmen's Bureau schools in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and then the newly founded Alcorn State University, where he graduated in 1878. Interestingly, he got his legal training in the offices of the prominent white attorneys, the McLaurin brothers uh, in Mississippi. The leader of the firm was Anselm McLaurin, who uh, later became governor of Mississippi in the late 1890s and US Senator from Mississippi in the 1900s. And yet he, he was willing to train a black, a young black lawyer like uh, Jones in the 1880s. In fact, he was known to have also trained others. Um, there's a lot to say about Jones's career, but I'd like to focus on five distinct efforts that he uh, engaged in for black civil and other rights during really throughout a, a long career. Um, so let me go to the first one. Okay, by 1890, there was a move had arisen in uh, Mississippi for the legislature to call a state constitutional convention to use legal restrictions to eliminate the black vote and to replace the violence, force, and intimidation that had been used since 1875 when the Mississippi Reconstruction government was violently overthrown. Jones, by 1890, Jones was one of only six black members in the 115 member Mississippi State House, although the state as a whole was majority black. And the legislature took up at that time the call for a constitutional convention to eliminate the black vote. On January 24th, 1890, and you see here the newspaper report uh, of his speech, um, Jones rose to speak against calling a convention for that purpose. Now his speech by and large was a careful argument for the importance of the right to vote, especially for poor and disadvantaged people. But his conclusion was kind of remarkable in the context of 1890 Mississippi. It pulled no punches. Quote, revolution, gentlemen, stares you in the face, unquote, if, if, if they go ahead with eliminating the black vote. And he added that, quote, your state will lose her maiden grandeur, your kingdom will have fallen, while your white dominion will be buried in the smoking ruin of destruction. And it's kind of remarkable that a black representative in 1890 Mississippi could have said things like this in the legislature uh, and lived to tell the tale, uh, but he did. Um, in fact, throughout his career, he was really, uh, uh, he was, he practiced law, I think, skillfully and well, but he was kind of, un he was uncompromising in recognizing what are the rights that were granted to Black citizens under the Civil War Amendments and in fighting for them. So anyhow, the legislature disregarded his warning. They called the convention. They adopted the new constitution, which included a variety of means to eliminate the Black vote, including the notorious understanding clause which required applicants to vote to demonstrate that they could read or understand a provision of the state constitution of, to the, that was selected by and to the satisfaction of the voting registrar who was white and no, def, clearly understood the intent of the provision. As a group, the understanding clause and the other provisions effectively accomplished what they intended and they eliminated the black vote. So Jones moved his fight to the court system. In, he spent the next 10 years fighting the 1890 Constitution's restrictions on black voting in every way he could. And he was virtually the only man in Mississippi who was actually doing something to advance that fight. First, he brought three cases to the US Supreme Court, Gibson v. Mississippi, Smith v. Mississippi, and Williams v. Mississippi. The first two were in 1896, the last was in 1898, that all attacked the disenfranchisement. Gibson and Smith were argued on the same day in December 1895. Jones argued Smith, and he enlisted DC attorney Emanuel Hewlett to argue Gibson. They were the second and third black attorneys to argue before the court. 
Unfortunately, the court rejected Jones' argument in both cases. Ironically, the opinions rejecting the arguments came down on the very day in April 1896 that Plessy v. Ferguson was argued. Two years later, in 1898, Jones brought Williams v. Mississippi to the Supreme Court. And here, he argued most directly that the 1890 Constitution was invalid, its voting provisions were invalid, and precisely because the very purpose of those provisions was to eliminate the Black vote. Now, nobody, the court or the, his opponents, nobody disputed that that was the purpose of the provisions, nor that they actually accomplished what they, what they said they, what they were trying to do. Nonetheless, the court unanimously held in Williams that a discriminatory purpose was not sufficient to invalidate a law, even if the whole point of the law was intentionally to discriminate against Black people without specifically naming them. Now, fortunately, the court's ruling against Jones and Williams against Mississippi did not stand the test of time. Ultimately, decades later, his arguments were vindicated, albeit too late to help him or his clients. In 1976, the Supreme Court, in a case called Washington v. Davis, essentially adopted the argument that Jones had made, that a law that was motivated by an racial and intent to discriminate on the ground of race was actually at the very core of an equal protection violation and was unconstitutional. And a few years later, a case called um, Hunter against Underwood, the Supreme Court actually, in effect, overruled Williams itself when it held invalid an Alabama provision that was exactly had been adopted a few years after the Mississippi Constitution of 1890 and that was modeled on its provisions. So ha having lost all of these court fights, Jones moved the fight to the halls of Congress. At the very same time, actually, of even while he was losing those, those uh, battles in the Supreme Court, he, was, he ran for Congress in 1896 in the third district of Mississippi, which was 85% black. Here you see actually a handbill, which just miraculously has somehow survived all those years since 1896. And actually, I always think that this handbill conveys some of the enthusiasm and excitement that somebody was actually running for Congress from the black community to, to do something about what was going on in Mississippi during this period. Well, he lost the election because Blacks had been eliminated from the voting rolls. His, his, the count was 3,069 votes to three, for his opponent to 369 for himself. But he brought his challenge then to the halls of Congress, which under the Constitution, each House of Congress is the judge of its own members' qualifications. And he went to the House of Representatives and he said, I should have won. If my people had been allowed to vote, the people who wanted to vote for me, I would have won. I would have won by a landslide, probably. Well, there was a procedure for uh, uh, litigating those challenges, and he spent the first three months of 1897 vigorously litigating them. He got evidence of cooked voter books, unfair and discriminatory application of the understanding clause, including registrars who demanded that voters before the black voters before they could register uh, should tell who was the name of Queen Elizabeth the first husband. By the way, he didn't have one. She didn't have one. What are the two greatest of the Ten Commandments and questions like that? He also amazingly obtained petitions signed by 5,043 Black men who said they would have voted for him in, in that district, but had been denied the opportunity to do so. And you can only imagine the courage that it took for Jones and for those who were collecting the petitions and for those who signed the petitions to do that and to go on record in that way in 1890, because it would have been 1897 Mississippi. In any event, unfortunately, although challenges like Jones's had won in the earlier 1890s and the late 1880s, by, the eight, by 1897, 1896 election, uh, the Republicans who controlled the House didn't really need a Black Republican vote from the South. They didn't need additional Black Republicans from the South. And uh, they, they were no longer really interested in vindicating this kind of challenge. So Jones's challenge died in committee. In 1898, he repeated the process. He again ran in the district, lost by a similar margin, and again unsuccessfully contested the result. After 1900, so that was uh, that. I think that ended. That did end Jones's uh, fight against the Mississippi Constitution of 1890 and the disenfranchisement of African Americans in Mississippi. But in, in 1900, 
he moved to the state of what would become the state of Oklahoma to Muskogee. Um, uh, um, and he, but he didn't give up the fight for black civil rights. An important issue pre-statehood was whether these voting restrictions that had been adopted in the South would be applied in the new state of Oklahoma. He, on August 17, 1904, Jones presided over the organizing convention of something called the Suffrage League of the Indian Territory, which was part of what would become Oklahoma, which passed resolutions demanding that Black voting and other rights be preserved in the new states. He actually negotiated by mail with uh, Senator Albert Beveridge, who was head of the Committee on Territories and was uh, shepherding the statehood bill through, and Beveridge assured him that Black voting rights would be, re be, uh, would be preserved. And they were preserved in the initial vote for statehood. But unfortunately, once statehood was declared, the new Oklahoma legislature adopted a, a thorough Jim Crow regime modeled on that that had been already adopted by most of the Southern states. In Oklahoma, just one other thing that Jones did that was interesting is he purchased the site of Chase, Oklahoma, one of more than 40 all black towns that were planned or established in Oklahoma during that period. And actually, after he did so, the railroad decided to pull its depot from the station. He challenged that before the Interstate Commerce Commission on the ground that they were discriminating uh, in doing so. But the, unfortunately, the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission rejected his challenge. Jones had one more fight in him, and it was an important one. This time, it was for reparations for ex-slaves. In the early 1900s, he had connected with Callie House, the leader of a thus far unsuccessful movement to urge Congress to give reparations to ex-slaves and opened a legal front in that battle. Now, the technicalities of the case are complex, but suffice it to say that he did, Jones discovered that the federal government had collected $68 million in taxes on uh, tax on cotton from 1862 through 1866. And most of that cotton had actually been picked by enslaved people in the South. The tax was doubtfully constitutional. And in 1915, he filed suit against the Secretary of the Treasury, William McAdoo, seeking something like what you might think of as a mechanics lien on the $60 million, which he said, since it had been elected unconstitutionally, just remained in the federal treasury for whoever was entitled to claim it. Um, he vigorously litigated the, case, litigated the case all the way to the Supreme Court, which unfortunately in 1917, rejected his claim on sovereign immunity grounds, the principle that you can't sue the government aside from certain exceptions for money damages. And the government responded not only to Jones's civil suit though in court, but also decided to pursue him with criminal charges of fraud as it had done to other proponents of rep rep reparations for ex-slaves. Now there, they, they, they prosecuted him and after a bunch of delays, it, he was finally brought to trial in 1918. The jury actually found him guilty, but the trial judge granted a judgment of acquittal to him because although the government's theory was that he had enlisted people to help pay for the suit, a dollar or two is what they paid uh, in order and to become claimants if he were successful. The government's theory was that he was promising them something that, that they were never gonna get. His theory was that he never, he, there was nothing dishonest about it or fraudulent at all. He promised them that if they participate and help out the suit, if the suit were successful, they would be able to share in the proceeds. The trial judge apparently agreed with Jones and granted him a judgment of acquittal. He was now free and for another decade through the 1920s, he continued to seek reparations for the ex-slave claimants from Congress. Um, he died in 19, March 23rd, 1931. And by the time he died, he was largely forgotten. His great fates, fights for civil rights were all unsuccessful. The country was not yet ready uh, to vindicate the principles of equality and the civil rights amendment, civil war amendments um, that he had uh, invoked. Um, his death was sadly marked by just this two sentence notice on the Oklahoma regional page of the Chicago Defender. Uh, and you can see it here. He just in saying that he was a prominent figure among the citizens of uh, Muskogee and the state at large which as an understatement, I couldn't imagine a greater understatement than that. Anyhow, for many decades, he was forgotten until the last 20 years or so. Um, but there were few black lawyers, I think, who struggled as hard as Jones did for as long a time with as little outside help and subject to as many risks to try, although he was unsuccessful, to preserve the rights black citizens had been granted by the Civil War amendments. 
I think he deserves to be better known. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And let me just start off by um, emphasizing once again that this is research that is truly pathbreaking. I mean, these are scholars who have who have um, unearthed sources and are basically uh, uh, telling stories and publishing articles on this um, um, on uh, those whose stories have not been told before. So this is so significant. Um, oftentimes when we think about uh, African-American advocates, uh, you know, those who are part of the African-American uh, uh, freedom struggle, we focus on the 20th century. We, we focus on the civil rights movement. We focus on Thurgood Marshall. Um, but here we have scholars who have actually uh, gone into the sources in the 19th century uh, for the most part. And they're telling these stories that are so important. So let me just sort of start there with the actual research that uh, all of you did. Um, how did you find the sources? How did you learn of the work of these individuals that you've been studying about? Well, I'll, I'll be happy to start, uh, uh, Tim. I, I've been studying early black lawyers uh, for a number of years and I think published my my first law review article on the subject in 2014 in the Howard Law Journal. And it started really on a localized effort. I wanted to answer a question that hadn't really been answered. You know, who was the first black lawyer in my home state of Texas? Uh, and, and the frustrating part, as I'm sure my colleagues have, have encountered, is that there's a dearth of information or there's misinformation, incorrect information. Um, with regard to that particular question, the first black lawyer in Texas, who also was the first black judge, first black elected district or county attorney was the title back then, uh, the historical records uh, for that county listed a white man as the office holder. Now, I found uh, the signed oath of office. I found the voting records. Um, you know, it, it, it involves a lot of musty archival research at times. Um, uh, it can also be frustrating by what is uh, what has been selectively chosen to be available. Uh, with some lawyers, uh, I've uh, found not the um, result of their bar admission, uh, but with many of these Black lawyers, because of the prejudice of the times, they were denied admission, oftentimes on you know questionable grounds, um, the first time or second time, even more, that they applied. And in some of these instances, I would find the records of their denials, but I wouldn't find extant uh, records of the good news, the admission. Uh, so um, one really... Um, uh, important source, and I think it's important to all, all three of us, is not just the traditional media, the newspaper, uh, contemporary newspaper accounts of mainstream or, or white newspapers, but the Black uh, uh, community's newspapers. Uh, you would see the um, fact of a Black lawyer being in the town or the county to argue as a novelty, you know, like the circus has come to town. You know, there's a black lawyer going to argue a case in the, in the courthouse or, you know, who, who could have imagined that sort of tone. Uh, and they would use oftentimes very uh, dismissive um, racialized language to describe uh, the lawyer. On the other hand, the black community's newspapers are describing these these advocates with great pride, understandably so, uh, and and really conveying their importance. So so that really uh, has been my experience is that um, in addition to the archival sources, one of the most important primary uh, sources uh, has been uh, early contemporary newspaper accounts. Well, you know, I I could. I can't resist telling the story of how I started with this because I actually made a, my career is as a lawyer. Uh, I've always been fascinated by history, but I'm, I'm a lawyer. I mainly uh, practiced before the Supreme Court in modern times. Um, but in early in my career, I mean, you might have mentioned this, I was researching the ex post facto clause, which actually comes into play a little bit in the Gibson v. Mississippi case and reading an opinion written by 
uh, the first Justice Marshall, the great dissenter in Plessy against Ferguson. And near the end of the opinion, after rejecting Jones's claims, uh, which I thought were pretty interesting here, that uh, you know, he says uh, these claims, and the quote is something like, "So forcibly presented by his counsel, who are of his race, uh, have to be rejected." And primarily, it was the procedural grounds that he was acting on. But I immediately it hit me that here's a, bl a black lawyer. It was clear from the uh, opinion and from the report that the, it was, was a, a story about a black a claim by actually a black criminal defendant. I said, oh my God, his lawyer was black. That's pretty interesting in 1896. And if you looked at the beginning of the report, you see it said Cornelius Jones, um, I don't know if it said Vicksburg, Mississippi or Green Greenville, Mississippi, I think is what it said. I thought, oh God, yeah, this guy was actually in Greenville at that time. And it just kindled an interest. And as I, over the years, I started looking more and more and realizing people had realized a little bit about what he had done here and there, uh, especially in the last 20 or 25 years. Um, some of it had been unearthed, but nobody had put it all together with the story of his life and enough to give people an understanding of the, the, the depth of what this man did throughout a very long career. I am, um, John Rock started off as a footnote in somebody else's work. I, I came across him and I got into, I, I, I'd met um, the late James Horton. I taught at George Washington University. And he had written a book um, entitled Black Brahmins. And he talks, Rock's life is peppered throughout mostly on his work as an abolitionist in uh, Beacon Hill in Boston. And uh, that is what prompted me to start digging in the weeds a little bit. And I was absolutely fascinated what I found. And when I came across these letters, I thought, wow, this is great. Now, unfortunately, another, there's so many unfortunate things here. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, most of us are aware to having done some research. You know, sometimes people don't have volumes and volumes of papers and that were published in in and in, uh, in leather bound or what have you. Uh, and in fact, Rock, we we can there's a uh, his his last will and testament. There's an announcement of his marriage in the Salem Sunbeam newspaper. Uh, so you know he was a real person and all of that. But as far as you know his legal proceedings, there's a few um, uh, legal briefs in his hand, uh, very few uh, to speak of that are that exist anymore, no diary to speak of. Uh, he passed away in 1866, his wife had actually preceded him, his mother and son both died in 1877, um, his son was, uh, I think, uh, junior or something at Lincoln uh, University, what is now Lincoln University in Chester or just outside Chester in Chester County, Pennsylvania. Um, so it, it was uh, not the easiest thing, but uh, what I have been able to discover on Rock's life, and I hope the article brings it out, is uh, mind numbing. And, and really, you know, because we're talking about um, this, you know, this organization obviously i didn't really get into the other aspects of his life like him practicing medicine him uh you know petitioning to travel to france and, and just after uh, tawny says you know announces in dred scott that blacks were never were not citizens and were never intended to be citizens uh so it actually became more difficult even though it was difficult before um sumner intervenes and um uh, few others do change Massachusetts law. The states had a lot more say than, than they do today. Uh, yeah. But that's a discussion perhaps for another time. But his life, there's just so full. Uh, one other piece uh, that I, sort of practical matter that I wanted to highlight here this evening is that, you know, if you think about it, and, and I was actually speaking with John about this uh, recently. If 
someone becomes an attorney, they obviously need clients. And if they don't have clients, what do they do for work? Right? Um, in Rock's case, um, or he, he did have clients from what we can tell. Again, the records of his legal work are somewhat scant. It seems that most of his uh, clients were black. Uh, and he did a lot of public speaking. I, I think that's how he, uh, he paid a lot of the bills. And there are in um, various newspapers indication that he, you know, the people were paying, you know, up to a dollar to go see him, which was, you know, a good amount of money back then. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to have been in, involved in this. And I, I hope to be able to expand upon his life in uh, some an, another um, African-American, spoiler alert, uh, Robert Morris, who was the second um, black lawyer in the United States, probably the first to actually really profit um, at all from his legal work. So that's all, all I wanted to share. Thank you. Yes, all of these very rich and very interesting stories as we think about how these men were all different and especially thinking about each of their circumstances and situations and how they had various barriers and challenges that they had to sort of deal with. And so, you know, thinking about Rock coming from the Northeast, but when he comes down to Washington, D.C., he has to have a freedom pass. And then you think about uh, 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 Waring is in Maryland, and then you have Jones down in the state of uh, Mississippi, down in the sort of deep south. So actually what we have here is somebody from the Northeast, from the Mid-Atlantic, um, and the uh, sort of south showing the, the, the whole sweep of the sort of Black freedom movement really from the Civil War on into the early decades of the 20th century. I'm wondering if each of you could talk a little bit more just about how that freedom movement um, intersected and overlapped with the struggles and the sort of barriers that each of these men faced, um, each in his own time. Well, I'll, I'll begin with, with Waring. Um, you know, he is, uh, you know, he, he's a true pathbreaker. Um, you know, there have been multiple challenges, legal challenges uh, to integrate the Maryland bar and and it finally clicks uh, with him. And he is um, uh, immediately put to work. He's sort of the de facto in-house counsel for this Brotherhood of Liberty. And they set about challenging various discriminatory uh, laws. And uh, uh, so he, he has his full plate. Um, and he, in many respects, makes arguments that were not successful immediately, but laid the groundwork for, you know, a later successful effort, sometimes argued by a white lawyer before the same court uh, a year or two later. And all of a sudden, you know, now the argument is, uh, you know, uh, fares somewhat better. Uh, but they, um, uh, you know, the challenge is, I, I think it can't be underestimated, not just the challenge to become a lawyer, to be admitted, uh, because let's let's face it, all these lawyers um, are being admitted to their respective uh, states uh, by reading the law generally, uh, by submitting themselves to an examination uh, by either a judge or a local bar committee appointed by a judge. And, you know, this can be a very subjective process and a much more difficult and involved process for the black aspiring attorney, the black candidate, as opposed to the white candidate for whom it's really, you know, perfunctory. And then when you're practicing, you know, you have to contend with arguing in front of white judges, white opposing counsel, all white juries. You have to contend with doing this in courthouses where you can't use uh, the facilities that are open to, um, you know, members of the, the white public. And, um, you know, you have to contend with all of this. In fact, in many states, uh, well up into late in the 19th century, there were statutes in place, including in states like California, where the testimony of a black witness 
uh, was not acceptable if testifying against a white litigant. Uh, you had to find some other witness to prove up your case. I mean, the, it, you know, I've tried a lot of cases in 33 years as a lawyer. You go up into that boxing ring, it's tough. It is even tougher to have one arm tied behind your back. Uh, many of these early black lawyers were having to fight that fight, sometimes seemingly with both arms tied behind their backs. Yeah, if I if I may, um, Rock's case is probably because he was so early on in this was particularly uh, challenging. I mean, four of the justices on the court that uh, Chase needed to convince. Of, of Rock's appropriateness for admission to the bar had agreed uh, with Pawnee on Dred Scott. And then you had um, uh, Nathan Clifford, uh, who was considered doe-face, so a northerner with Southern sympathies. Um, David Davis, who famously said, a Negro can never be elevated to social and political rights in this country, and all wise statesmen know it. So <laughs> that's I mean, th those are some pretty uh, difficult odds to overcome. Um, so further to uh, John's point, um, this it, it wasn't easy. Um, it, it's definitely, it, it, like I think John said, perfunctory, uh, the, you know, the three years of good, sir, you know, sort of, uh, practice in your home state and the recommendation from, <clears throat> from a, a current member in good standing with the Supreme Court bar. Um, but that wasn't so easy to get that for these lawyers. Yeah, I would say for uh, Jones, I, there's two, there's really a two thoughts I have. One is he lived in Isacania County, Mississippi, which is a small county that had overwhelmingly black. I think it was 90% plus black. Um, the neighboring counties were Bolivar and Washington County, which were also largely 80, 85 percent black. Um, and his practice, the cases he brought to the Supreme Court came from those counties. Those two counties, I think, were second and third in the country in lynchings in the whole, in, both in the 1890s and in the period up until 1950. Um, and, you know, he, at one point in 18, before actually, uh, before he was practicing law, he actually, he spoke at a, uh, a, a rally, a political rally for some Republican candidates. And there was a group of black citizens from the neighboring area who were coming to the rally and were set upon in a, a, a well-known incident that a lot of uh, you know, historians have, have recognized. They were set upon by uh, some white Democrats who were trying to keep them from being involved in politics at all and murdered. Basically, they shot, I think the three of them wounded a couple of more. Um, Actually, the newspaper report said they were looking for a black politician, and I've always wondered whether it might even have been Jones himself, since he was scheduled and did speak at the rally. But he definitely faced threats of violence uh, uh, in in his career, and how he avoided uh, how he avoided that, and how he got his cases to the Supreme Court. One of his clients, Gibson. Actually, well, he was he was tried four times. Jones actually got his convi first conviction reversed uh, by the Mississippi Supreme Court, but not 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 his ultimate one. Um, so, on the one hand, there's that. On the other hand, I would say something that has intrigued me is that, as I said, Ansel McLaurin, who was a later governor of uh, of Miss white supremacist Mississippi in 1896 to 1900, and then a U.S. senator appointed by the uh, state legislature. Um, was his mentor, and he'd studied law under McLaurin in the 1880s, and he wasn't the only one. There was another Black lawyer, well-known man named uh, Samuel Beadle, and actually when Beadle went into court to try to take the, uh, be examined to, uh, uh, by the judge to join the bar, the judge refused to do it, and McLaurin apparently fought for him and got, uh, somehow got convinced the judge to hold another hearing, and after, it was a pretty uproarious hearing. Uh, uh, there was a lot of uproar at the hearing, but he ended up getting admitted. So there was that also, and the role of that, whether that connection with McLaurin helped him or what, uh, that's for further research. I, I want to touch on one thing that, that uh, Jim mentioned. The mere fact of being a Black lawyer in, in those days, 
was enough to uh, result in racialized violence, including lynchings. Uh, a number of early Black lawyers were, were lynched. Uh, one of the first Black graduates of, of Howard Law School uh, was lynched in Arkansas when he arrived in the community to set up a practice. Um, uh, RCO Benjamin, uh, who was the first Black lawyer in California, he was licensed in other states. Uh, he returns to Lexington, Kentucky, and he's in the act of registering Black voters, and he is shot and killed. Uh, he shot about five or six times in the back by a white man because he dared to be a black lawyer registering voters in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, a, a white man who was later, you know, uh, the case is dismissed. It doesn't even get to a jury. It's dismissed on grounds of self-defense, shooting him five or six times in the back. Um, you know, sadly, you know, not a uh, an isolated instance in, in the Jim Crow South. Uh, you know, just the fact I mean, it took tremendous courage to even be a Black lawyer, uh, let alone take some of these cases that they were uh, advocating. Yeah, it just, this is going outside the scope of the period that we're talking about. But, you know, the, what what was just said made me think about uh, the trials and tribulations of uh, a very well-known Black lawyer, V. Thurgood Marshall, and the stories of him sleeping in in people's basements to uh, escape lynch mobs um, as he was trying district uh, federal district court cases for the uh, legal defense fund of the NAACP so yeah good point thank you all I think we have time for uh, uh, one last question let me let me ask you this what further uh, research needs to be done on this topic or similar topics and how does the work that you have already done change how we think about supreme court history i've been going first so i'll, I'll let somebody else jump in first <laughs> <laughs> um jim you want to go or do you want yeah, well, me to go okay I mean, what I, I, I can say is this. One thing I found out about Jones that I thought was pretty interesting is that in the uh, Gibson and Smith cases, these were these men had actually been convicted of murder and were sentenced to death when the cases came to the Supreme Court. And I found the uh, records of the court itself. And I, it was interesting that the court, it's, it went... Um, uh, when when the, the case was just coming to the court and they needed a stay of execution, the court granted the stay and the justice said, you know, put let the people of Mississippi know about this and put it on my tab if you have to pay for the wire, because I don't want to see this guy executed, you know, if his case is still should be in court. And so uh, I thought that actually said uh it was even though he voted against him ultimately and the man and Gibson was executed in the end. Um, he was standing up for justice, the, the court was, and, and regular procedures. And at least I didn't see instances in the Supreme Court where the kinds of things that John was talking about and the kinds of things that did go on in the Mississippi courts, I didn't see instances of that happening uh, in the Supreme Court. I just say that as far as further research, there's an enormous amount additional to do about his life. And as uh, Chris said, about I think about the rest of his practice and what else he was doing Aside from these five things I, I uh, outlined, I, I think those are would be fertile sources for somebody to look into. And, and I think uh, to allude to what uh, Jim was saying, you know, the role that was played by other uh, Black Supreme Court advocates around that time, uh, like Emmanuel Molyneux Hewlett, um, mm -hmm. uh, haven't been fully explored. And he played a pivotal role in multiple cases. He was something of a of a Washington DC fixer uh, to a certain extent because he was a judge. He was a justice of the peace in the District of Columbia appointed because it's the District of Columbia. It's a presidential appointment and it was considered quite a plum for uh, and something of a political um, uh, sort of patronage um, thing by a Republican president to appoint to this high profile position, a, uh, a black lawyer. So, you know, and he has a fascinating history that is yet to be really fully explored uh, along with other uh, ones. And I think, uh, you know, I've been sort of focusing 
on a number of um, individuals, on certain states, uh, because shockingly, uh, I say that with tongue firmly in cheek, many official state histories are wrong. Uh, I recently published an article uh, in the Georgia Bar Journal, and Georgia, the Georgia Bar's official history would have you believe there were no black lawyers in the state until midway through the 20th century. And the first one appears in the 1870s. Um, so, you know, part of our work, I think all three of us is really correcting some, you know, misconceptions uh, that exist and not just filling voids uh, in, in, you know, the historical research. And then there are in individuals going back to the very beginning, you know, uh, uh, Chris mentioned, you know, Robert Morris, the second black lawyer in the U.S. Uh, I've been researching Macon Balling Allen, the first black lawyer. There's really such a an absence. Um, and the state of Massachusetts, five of the first seven black lawyers admitted in the U.S. are admitted in Massachusetts. Uh, what's to be done more on John Rock? I think, you know, I when I have the time um, there, I know where to look, where he, any legal records of his, uh, of his life, uh, his legal professional life may be found. Uh, we'll see what we can turn up. None of it's listed by his name. It'd be by plaintiff name and numbers that, would uh, in case number so i've got my work ahead of me <laughs> but um i would say really i think contextualizing and I, I touched upon this but better contextualizing their lives um because i think by better contextualizing their lives it ha can help to provide a fuller story so when i say their lives so the, not only the challenges but also the successes and sort of giving a full picture um their sort of demeanor i think that the very quick quote that i had about the sort of black is beautiful uh, a concept that rock is often attributed with even though he doesn't say that explicitly um says a lot about his character right um he, even though he's in boston uh, it's it's not like there wasn't any violence in Boston. I mean, if we think about the uh, uh, some of the violence by certain immigrant groups against blacks, um, wasn't pretty. Um, it, it, you didn't have to go south to see it. Um, New York, you know, obviously, most famously the draft rides, but also in 1844 in Philadelphia. Um, so it it wasn't pretty or in the city of there was a story in 1834 in Newark, New Jersey, a, um, a Presbyterian congregation invited a, a black uh, um, or these the elders invited a black preacher to preach on a given Sunday. Well, the congregation physically removed the uh, the preacher from the pulpit, carried him to the local jail thing he deserved to be in prison then they returned to the church and destroyed it brick by brick uh that's the news report from 1834 so uh, you didn't have to go south to have these experiences and i think that that is part of the story and also as far as supreme court history i think this is uh, tim huber's uh, question uh, I think this says something about the court because interspersed even with rock who never actually argued a case before the court interspersed you're getting with some heavy hitters who either did argue before the court at some point had something to do with the court or were on the court i think you know chief justice chase being most notable here and and i think about john catron uh, catron um from tennessee and some of his uh, beliefs uh, so and i could go on and on but the point is that there is more to, there is more to see there is more to review there's more to write about that's for sure and that's just on him and as uh the others alluded to it's not just them i think it is just broader context of black advocates and what did that mean i mean I, i'm not convinced necessarily today that is i'll say it's not a big deal but it's not nearly as challenging 
as it certainly was 100, 150 years ago, that's for sure. Thank you. Uh, before we sign off, I just want to highlight uh, uh, once again, all of these are articles published in the Journal of Supreme Court History. Um, Jim uh, Feldman's piece on Cornelius um, Jones is in this volume. This is volume 47, number two. Um, John Browning's essay on Everett, on, um, on Everett uh, Waring is in this issue, which is volume 47, number three. And um, Chris Brooks' piece on John S. Rock is forthcoming in uh, volume 47. Eight that's coming out this summer, uh, July of 2023. So my thanks to um, all of you, to uh, Chris Brooks, to John Browning, to Jim uh, Feldman, and of course to our executive director of uh, Jim Dell. Um, thanks for a wonderful panel and a great opportunity to think about the history of Black advocates. So. Uh, Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim.